We are beginning this campaign. We've said it last week that these spiritual growth campaigns are the, the best way for you to go to another level. And uh, I, I challenged you with some commitments last week. You know, the reason I did that is you don't grow by just information. You grow by making commitments, by committing to something. So I challenged you, 15 minutes a day, have a prayer time, all right? And, and fast something, and we challenged you, come to one of the prayer meetings. If you, if you don't do 6.30, come Wednesday night if you're more of a night person. But we want you to plug in and experience that. If you can, read the book, come Sunday, and join the life group. It's going to be amazing. And, and today, I want to continue talking about how to draw bigger, bolder circles of prayer. And really feel that God's uh, calling us by the Holy Spirit to stretch us to deeper places. And, and part of that is, is to really say, help me move, God, from a small view of what you could do with my prayer to a, to a God-sized view. Uh, God could do more in and through your life than you can imagine. That's what the Bible says. And he does it as you learn to pray the prayers of faith. And, and he changes things, first inside of you and then on the outside of you. Um, we, are, we are talking in this series about maybe a different kind of prayer than some of you learned growing up. You see, all religions pray, but all prayer is not Jesus-centered. I found even atheists kind of pray. They wish on a star, hope the cowboys will do something, whatever it is. People want the force to be with them or they, you know, whatever their lucky star is all, that whole kind of thing, that's not Bible prayer. For some, prayer is sort of like a last resort. Well, we tried everything else. How many know it's better to make prayer your first option? <laughs> For others, prayer is sort of a religious ritual. We just kind of go through the motions. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray to the Lord my soul. And, and kind of that kind of prayer is fine. But it doesn't really touch the heart. For some, prayer is like a, a performance, getting brownie points with God. All right, I prayed. And, and some even kind of tout, Lord, I've been good this week. How many know that doesn't matter? <laughs> it's not like you earn God. He is a God of grace. For some, prayer is, is more a, just an idea of trying to manipulate God, pry out of God's hand something. But we want to talk about a different kind of prayer. A, a, a prayer in Jesus' name that's not prying things out of God's hand. It's partnering with God to bring his presence to a world that's out of sync. How many know we live in a world of, where there's darkness? There's, there's so much that God's will isn't happening in. And there's, there's heartbreaking things. Suicide, darkness, despair, depression. But God said... That I am giving you this tool to change the atmosphere, to, to bring what's in heaven to be felt on earth. And, and prayer for us is so powerful because that's why Jesus died, is to give us access to the very holy of holies. The Bible says because of Jesus, we don't come to God like beggars. We come like daughters and sons. We come boldly into his presence. We come knowing that he, he favors us. That his promises are for us because of what Jesus did for us. I like to say we come and we get to have Father's credit card. I mean, it's like, hey, what do you want? I, I can act on your behalf. In Jesus' name, the storehouse of heaven is open to you. And you can boldly say, God, I'm not settling for an unprayed for life. I'm settling for a life that's defined by prayers that you give me. I remember when this shift first happened for me. I was just 12 years old and... And it's just a silly thing, but I'll never forget. My, my little, I had this little shaggy dog named Buster, and he ran away. We looked everywhere. For three days, couldn't find the dog. It wasn't at the pound. Finally, my mom says, hey, Dale, why don't, you, why don't you really do a prayer walk? Just go around the neighborhood. And it was the first time I prayed a, you know, one of these circle kind of prayers. I just was walking. Lord, I pray that you help me find Buster. Lord, I just know. I'm asking, Lord. I'm just this 12-year-old kid. Everybody thought I was crazy. But I'm walking up and down the street. And I go a couple of blocks. And all of a sudden, I hear, woof, woof, woof. And sure enough, he was in a backyard. And I jump, he jumps in my arms. And it wasn't that I just got my dog back. But I said, ooh, this is a different way to live. 
Maybe I'm going to experience something my friends don't have. Maybe I've, I've understood God has more for me than I thought. And I begin to live a prayer-centered life that has changed everything about my life. And this is my burden for you, that you would experience a greater depth than you've ever known. And it would change everything. We want to look at a story in the Old Testament of this kind of circle-making prayer. A, a, a different kind of prayer that was a defining moment in history. And I just love this idea that your defining spiritual moments will be because of prayers that you prayed. And, and this is a story in Joshua 10. And, and, and it's a story. You remember we've talked about Joshua 6 is where the walls of Jericho, they go around and those walls fall down. Well, if you go on chapter 7 or 8, things aren't going so well. They begin to kind of, you know, one, one chapter, this guy Achan steals gold from Jericho. They weren't supposed to touch any of it. And, and then all kinds of crazy things happen. And then, and then even Joshua makes a mistake. How many know people of faith sometimes fail, all right? Anybody ever have a spiritual relapse? <laughs> I was going pretty good and whoops, blew that one again. But how many are glad God is merciful? So what Joshua does is he, he's there and the Lord told him, don't make any treaties because this is a land you're supposed to possess. And these people called the Gibeonites, they come pretending to be from another place. And they act, you know, they got these old clothes on and they say, oh, we're just from far away. Would you make a treaty with us, Joshua? And, and he does. He makes a covenant. Well, come to find out, no, they were really from Canaan. He wasn't supposed to do it. And no sooner has he made that treaty than the Gibeonites get attacked by five other kings who come and, and, and attack them. And, and the Gibeonite king calls jo Joshua and says, come and help us. We're being attacked. And Joshua, you gave your word. And so he, he marches all night and, and they go into this battle. And God helps them. Hailstones start falling on the enemy. How many know that helps a little bit? Uh, there's a, a victory, and all of a sudden, the other enemy army starts scattering. But Joshua sees an opportunity. He says, man, they're just going to go and regroup. And, and all of a sudden, he prays this crazy prayer. So let's read it, Joshua chapter 10 and verse 12. On that day, the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel. And Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, Sun, stand still. Can you say that with me? Sun, stand still over Gibeon. And you moon over the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the nation avenged itself on its enemies. As is written in the book of Jashar. The sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. There's never been a day like it before or since. A day when the Lord listened to a human being. Surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. Now this is, this is, isn't that just a crazy prayer? Sun, stand still. Someone said, well, how could that happen? I mean, I'm a, I, know, you know, I know the science. The earth revolves around the sun. And Hey, listen. God knew Joshua's heart. <laughs> I don't know how it happened, but I know there was another day of light. And, and, it, and, and that made all the difference. Instead of them just getting a little bit of victory, they got total victory. God turned a failure into a victory. God turned an a attack into an overwhelming advance. Because one man dared to pray this audacious prayer. <laughs> Stand still, son. And there's things I just love about this because it speaks so much to us today. One, that God wants to do amazing miracles in and through our lives that will happen if we draw these bold circles of prayer. How many know bold prayers honor God and God honors bold prayers? There's something God loved about this. He doesn't say, Joshua, are you kidding? That's a weird prayer. He says, I love it. I love it. You know, I remember a story about Alexander the Great. One of his generals was going to get married and came and he asked this ridiculous thing. Uh, Alexander said, what can I give you? And he asked one of those like third of your kingdom requests. And another guy said, don't, how dare you ask the king that? And it was going to really take him down. And, and Alexander said, no, wait a second. 
His request says two things. Number one, that he thinks I'm very rich. And number two, he thinks I'm very generous. Give him what he wanted. How many know God wants you to think he's very rich and he's very generous? And he wants you to come boldly and say, God, things I've never thought of asking, I never thought could happen, I'm going to ask you for them. You see, I believe even Heart for the World has been built on seeing God intervene. Things that we could have never done. I mean, I can't believe I just got back from Africa. Can you believe a year ago? Someone calls me from Africa that says, can you help me turn a tribe from witchcraft to Jesus? And we go over there. Thousands of people get saved. I go back. There's 40 Bible studies. People are healed. I'm telling you, only God could do that. I don't even know how it happened. I, I look at this building, and many of you know the story. We were just a little storefront church, and we were trying to build on Highway 70, and, and, and the neighbor up there wouldn't let us build a road. We were stuck for four years. All of a sudden, Pastor Vistine calls me and says, hey, we're moving out of this building. And I come and look at it, and I see it, and I say, oh, my goodness. I had faith for a 20,000 square foot. This thing is 36,000, two kitchens. I said, oh, man, this is so amazing, but we could never afford this. And when I got home, I said, well, yeah, Sharon, it was awesome, but we could never afford it. She says, Dale, where is your faith? You know? I said, oh, yeah, I'm the man of faith. I just forgot about that one, you know. So we call this prayer meeting. They let us come here. We march circles around this room. That very week, someone calls. We have this little piece of property worth about $200,000. He said, what would you sell that property for? I said, well, we need $500,000 for a down payment. So I said, $500,000. He says, I'll have a check to you by Friday. <laughs> and we got the down payment. And you know what's so amazing? Here we are. It's not that just God did a miracle, but every time I walk into this building, I remember one thing. You are here because of a miracle. You are sitting, you are standing because God did a miracle. And if God could do a miracle then, 2005, God can do a miracle today in 2019. Don't stop now. I love to say a miracle a day keeps the devil away. Hallelujah. It's time to keep stretching. It's time for something bigger than you ever dreamed or ever thought could happen. One of the great tragedies of life is that we settle. We become complacent, low vision people who don't pray extreme prayers. I put in your notes, God wants extreme people who pray extreme prayers of faith for extreme needs that are around us everywhere. How many know somebody who needs an extreme miracle? <laughs> All right, you're sitting next to him. Bless him in Jesus' name. But anyhow, how many know somebody who needs a sun stand still kind of prayer? They don't just need a regular prayer. How many know some need a, a, re, a relationship restored? It can't be restored except by a sun stand still kind of prayer. An addiction broken, a financial impossibility. A health disease. I don't know what it is, but I do know there's something in your life today that you need to so daringly, boldly say, God, let the sun stand still over my marriage. Yes. Only you can do it, God. But you can do it, God. I believe. See, the small thinking that we often have limits God. Mark Batterson said in there, he said, one of the greatest of life, of tragedies of life is prayers that go unanswered because they were never prayed. <laughs> Wouldn't it be sad to get to heaven and say, I had a revival for you, but you never asked for it. You were, you were settling. You, you thought this was enough. But I had something greater. I, I don't want you to limit me. Look at this verse in Psalm 78, 41. Talking about Israel, it says, yes, again and again, they tempted God. What does that mean? Again and again, they blocked what God wanted to do. Isn't that a sad story? Yes, God, I know you could do something. No, thank you. And it says they limited. Someone say limited. Limited the Holy One of Israel. In another place, God says, my arm isn't short. That it cannot save. It's your heart. That's stopping me. It's you 
by your, your hardness, by your doubt, by your, your, your small thinking. James 4.3 says, you have not because you ask not. What a, a statement, isn't it? How many would rather ask for everything and get half of it than ask for nothing and get that? <laughs> How many would just up your, your prayer life to say, I don't want anything that God puts on the table left there. In Jesus' day, he went to his hometown, but he could do no mighty works there because they didn't believe. They didn't go beyond the status quo of their religious thinking. God wants to turn that around. How? He does it first of all by getting us to draw circles of prayer around how great he is. Can I tell you where, where world-changing prayer starts? It starts with a fresh vision of how great our God is. How many even felt as you worshiped, all of a sudden, your problems were like this, and God was someone like this, and then as you worshiped, woo, God was like this, and your problems were, God can handle that, God can handle that, God can handle that. God speaks over and over, magnify me. He says, I created the heaven and the earth. Is there anything too hard for me? What is it that you think I cannot do? Begin to draw circles. I, I tell people, I've been giving you these different kind of prayers if you're getting my emails. And, and one of them is, if I wake up in the night and I can't sleep, I do my ABC prayer, which is, I take A and then B, and I think of every attribute of God that fits with that letter. So I start off A. I don't count sheep. I, I count attributes of God. But anyhow, A, God, you're awesome, amazing. God, you're accessible to me now. You're available to me now. God, you're beautiful, big, and bountiful. You're conqueror, creator, commander of all the angels of the universe. And I go through that in about 10 minutes. I, either I'm asleep or I'm ready to ask for the nations as my inheritance. Because I see how big he is. Just every day, hear the Lord say, I'm bigger than you think. I'm bigger than you think. You think that's hard for me? I'm bigger than you think. As you do and focus on him, it changes your perspective. I've told you the story about the little boy who got a telescope, but he looked at the bully across the street from the wrong end of the telescope. And his mom says, why are you looking through that end? And he said, well, the bully looks a lot smaller this way. And how many know when you, when you look from God's angle, the enemy is a lot smaller. Those problems are a lot smaller. I'm just declaring you today, get a big vision of God. Make that the center of your life to know God, who he is, and how great he is. Number two, this story reminds us that the great things we have in our lives today are because of great prayers. Other people prayed for us. We're going to be learning in this study that I call it the genealogy of prayer. And that is, if you, if many of you look at things, I don't know, did anybody have a grandma or someone like that prayed for you or whatever it was, right? And, and you look at some things today, and if you really think about it, someone prayed that into your life. One thing I love about prayers is they have no expiration dates. How many know a prayer 100 years ago? It still has power today. Man, I'm going to leave a bunch of prayers behind, I'll tell you. They, 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 they still have power. And we should be so grateful. And that's why I want you to get in one of these circles. We're going to pray for each other in our circle every day for 21 days. I'm telling you, you're going to be so prayed for. It's going to blow your mind what God does. Uh, again, from the book, I love what he said. He said, every dream, blessing, or miracle in our life has a genealogy. If you trace it all way back to its origin, you will find a prayer circle somewhere. And I've told people how, when I was 36, the Lord called me to go preach in the Philippines. Well, I never knew I was supposed to be an evangelist in the Philippines or anywhere in the world. But when God spoke that to me, I, I planned to go and I'll never forget because my mom and dad called me over to eat with them. And they said, Dale, you don't understand this. And they brought out something very cool. They, they, they brought out this, this barong, which is a Filipino dress shirt. 
And they said, Dale, when you were like four or five years old, we were praying for you. And God showed us that you would be an evangelist to the nations. We didn't tell you this because we didn't want to manipulate you. But we prayed every day for you. And we believed that God told us that the first place you would go is the Philippines. And so we bought this for you. And this is to tell you, God's got his anointing for you when you go. You know, that helped me so much to know, oh my goodness, I'm riding on the prayers that before I even was five years old were prayed for me, were spoken over me, were declared over me in my life. Abraham had prayed for this land for Joshua 400 years earlier. God answered the prayer 400 years later. He gave the land that Abraham had prayed for. Thirdly, this story reminds us that God answers prayers not because we are good, but because Jesus is good. All prayers are answered because of mercy, not because of merit. You see, I just love the fact that when Joshua prayed this prayer, he had just messed it up. He had just made a treat. He wasn't supposed to do that. And how many know the enemy loves to condemn us? He says, ah, you don't deserve that. You're going to pray to get out of debt. You made the stupid decision to get into that. <laughs> You're going to pray for your marriage. I, I, you weren't supposed to get married to that person anyhow or something like that. But God never does that. James 1.5 says when we ask God, he never holds our faults against us. How many know he's a good, good father? Hallelujah. He, he answers our prayers not because of us, but because of Jesus. Because Jesus has stood on our behalf and has given us his right standing. It's called righteousness. The right to stand before God as if we were Jesus. I mean, that's amazing. How many know God's never got upset at Jesus, right? <laughs> and you're in Jesus. So every time you come in God's presence, he says, wow, you're amazing. You know, My son, my daughter. That's why we come boldly. We have his promises, and they're ours. 2,000 promises are in that book. And everyone, you know what they say under them? Yes and amen. amen. They're for you. Come boldly. Ask. God specializes. Aren't you thankful? God specializes in turning our mistakes into miracles. Have you ever seen God take your fertilizer and make it his flowers? I don't know if you've seen the stuff that you've messed up in life, but God's mercy was greater than your mess up. Hallelujah. I expected a better amen than that. But anyhow, I love it. Romans 4, 16 says, look at Abraham. You know, when God answered Abraham's prayer, he had just kind of got off track. He had... This concubine, Hagar, and God never told him to, you know, to have a child by her. And yet, Abraham came back to faith and said, God, I believe, even though I'm 99 years old. In Romans 4, 16, it says, therefore, the promise comes how? By faith, not by your works, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all of Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but those who have a faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. This story tells us that God loves us to pray specific, daring, audacious prayers of faith. Because bold prayers honor God and God honors bold prayers. I want you to see something about the specificity. I don't know if even that's a word. But anyhow, the specificness of this prayer. Son, stand still. It was a direct, it was a, a declaration. If you know anything about Hartford World, we make declarations. <laughs> and, and the idea was that it wasn't vague. How many know a vague prayer doesn't have much faith in it? God bless all the children of the world. Well, that's, that's nice. But there's no fire in that. How many have ever prayed a prayer like this? Lord, be with me today. Okay, that's good, but the Lord said I was planning on it anyway. What God loves is if you go deeper. So this week I didn't pray, God, be with me today. I prayed, God, 
Help me be aware of your presence today so that at least five times I become consciously aware that you're helping me think and make a decision that I can't make on my own. See, that's a little more powerful, isn't it? One of the reasons we did this prayer journal, we want you to have a prayer journal, make it your own, but whatever. Because it is so powerful as you're interceding, as you get these promises, and God begins to stir something in you. That you don't just think about it generally, but you write it. Rick Warren says that thoughts get in disentangled when they go from our brain through a pencil onto paper. Somehow we're able to undo these generic things into definitive decisions of faith that we make. I've got all kinds of ones I'm writing in here. You know, we're training life group leaders. I prayed that the Lord would send me 20 life group leaders to train. And 20, 23 or 25 came the other night. But then I said, and in one year, they will train 100 other leaders in Jesus' name. See, that's a specific prayer. You're going to do this, God. When I was praying to start this church, I, we were there and, and we had this little Bible study. Grew down to about three people. And the Lord told me, I want you to go lay hands on the Pan Am Center. Because I was asking the Lord for souls. And he said, I want you to ask me for enough souls in Las Cruces that you will fill up that Pan Am Center someday. How many know that took a little faith for a pastor of three people? 12,485 seats. I said, Lord, I'm claiming 12,485 souls for your kingdom. This is boldness. This is declaring. Look at Mark chapter 11, verses uh, 22 through 23. Jesus is going to say this. He's just done something interesting. The disciples had seen Jesus come to this fig tree the day before. It had no figs on it, and Jesus cursed the fig tree. He said, may you never have fruit again. The next day they walked by, and the whole fig tree is dead to its roots. And it was a prophetic warning of what would happen to Jerusalem if they would not believe. And, 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 but what the disciples noticed was, oh, my goodness, that was amazing, Jesus. Tell me what's going on there. And so Jesus says, I want to teach you about faith. How many know one of the things we're going to pray against is strongholds. We're going to command, God, let that bondage of addiction be destroyed and die at the roots in Jesus' name. You know, We're going to speak these powerful things. But here's what it says. It says, he, Jesus says, okay, let me show you how faith works. He says, have faith in God, Jesus answered. Truly, I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, can you say says to this mountain? <laughs> Go throw yourself into the sea. And does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen. It will be done for them. Can you say, it will be done for them? In Job 22, 28, it says, you will declare a thing and it will be established for you so your light will shine. There is this point where faith becomes a word. God, I believe and thank you. I've asked you for this. I thank you that it's happened now. I praise you for it. I believe you for it. And it gives God the glory. In this verse, I love what it says. It says, whatever you desire when you pray. Now, I looked at this, and I think this is a really important truth. Because prayer, he talks about a prayer that comes from a desire. But he's not talking about any desire. How many know there's fleshly desires? There's, oh, you know, make me rich and beautiful and let the cowboys win. Whatever it is, those are the desires of the flesh. And the Bible says no guarantee on those because you're praying after your own lust. But the prayer he's talking about is when you desire. There's a verse in Psalm 37, 4. It says, if you delight in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. What are the desires of your heart? When you're worshiping God, one thing I always teach people, pray in before you pray out. Pray into your spirit. Pray surrender. Pray forgiveness. Pray to become what God wants you to be before you ask God to give you what you want to have. You begin to pray, God, renew my mind. God, heal me. God, let your priorities come in my life. God, restore to me faith and joy and purpose. And as you're praying in that, suddenly into your soul comes these deep desires. And you know they're not just yours. They're the Holy Spirit. 
Oh God, I don't want my family to repeat the strongholds of my gener former generation. Oh God, I know that this business is supposed to do something great for God. God, I know in my spirit that my marriage is supposed to have a breakthrough. God, I know deep inside of my life to my gut that I'm supposed to do this ministry. I'm supposed to help these people. God, I desire this in prayer. And then specifically say it. God, I ask in Jesus' name. Some people kind of vaguely pray prayers. Lord, if it be your will. There's nothing wrong with that. But again, God wants you to show you his will. I mean, it wouldn't make a lot of sense if I said, Sharon, if it be thy will, bring me some water today. <laughs> she would say, man, you've been preaching too much. No, i just say, honey, could I have some water? When you come to God... He wants you to have confidence. He's your father. And he's put things in your heart that are good. And he wants you to boldly pray your son's standstill prayer. And he will honor that. And he will answer that. These prayers are not only specific, but they're passionate. I like to call these kind of prayers rebellion against the status quo. I like this kind of a thing. There's something that circle makers have in their spirit that, that, that God puts a holy discontent. Can I tell you, every time God does something great in your life, usually it begins with this burden. This isn't right. There's got to be more. This shouldn't be this way. You begin to get this agitation in your spirit. Somewhere in the Bible it calls it your groanings. It's sort of like, Yes, I've got the American dream, but there is more. Yes, this is, this is a good day. Yes, we got a victory, but I think there's a bigger victory that we're supposed to get. And you, you're feeling this inside of you. Or, or you're seeing your neighbors and they're suffering and, and your heart is broken and you kind of maybe remember the Popeye pray. I can't stand this. I can't stand it no more. I can't stand that the devil is messing with them, Lord. And your passion says, God, we're not going to accept the unacceptable. We're not going to just live a normal life. God, we believe the kingdom of God has in it a mighty change. We believe for revival. You know, this is in my heart. It's not that I'm praying, God, could we have a successful church? No, I'm praying that the Las Cruces city would be changed, that it would be moved on by God, that no one here would miss an opportunity in the whole city to be saved. It's stretching a bigger circle than what I could see or do. And it's being willing to pave the way for that to happen. You know, I was, I was there in, in Chichondo again. I'm seeing all these malnourished kids. And I was reminded that when I got home, not just to pray, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Give us this day our daily bread. And the Lord, show me, what is your daily bread? Well, I used to think, God, help me pay all my bills and have my family have enough. And the Lord said, what if your daily bread, what if when you prayed, give us our daily bread, you were praying for all the kids who are orphaned? What if, give us this day, our daily bread was, God, let us feed 100,000 kids today. <laughs> now you're talking. You see, taking a circle that was this big, let me pay my bills. And suddenly saying, God, let me change a world. I was over there and I was saying, God, I want to pray for these kids. And I was sort of praying, Lord, what part do you want us to play in Chitondo? And God was saying to me, that's the wrong question. You ought to ask, what would it take to see tra Chitondo transformed? See, I like to limit it. God, what's the little thing I can? God says, no, take ownership for the big thing. Okay, if they need 12, 20 wells of clean water, why don't you ask me? I'm not poor. I can do bigger than you could ask or think. Make a bigger circle. Make a bolder circle and watch what I can do. God has a bigger anointing on you than you have known. Do not live your life for small dreams. Do not settle for just a good American life, when you could be a, a world changer. I remember reading this from Stephen Furtick as this amazing Elevation Church and has done so much for God. And he said the turning point in his life, he, he was a young man and he read this book by Jim Cimbala. Maybe some of you have heard of it, Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire. And Jim Cimbala was 
kind of going. He was the normal kind of pastor, but he had this ache inside of him. And he wrote this in the book. He said, I, dis I despaired at the thought that my life might slip by without seeing God show himself mightily on my behalf. And suddenly, Stephen Verdict just felt like he got punched in the gut. And he said, oh, my God, I can't bear the thought that my life will pass, but I never saw you do what you've done in your word. I never saw a move of God. I never saw a miracle in my family. And he began to press in. He began to go for it. And God has done it in his life. That is what I put in here, is the world needs people who have a bigger vision than themselves, who will pray prayers way bigger than their own needs, who will pray that God will give them. I tell you, our, 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 we, we call it our life verse prayer from Psalms 2.8 for Heart for the World Church is Psalm 2.8 says, Lord, give us the nations for our inheritance. God, I thank you for Las Cruces, but we're not even stopping there. Give us the nations for our inheritance. Fourthly, this kind of prayer involves committed action. It's not simply a, a prayer to God, but it's a prayer with God that commits to, to putting feet to it. You know, it says that Joshua, after he prayed, it says they marched all night. They, they went to battle. How many know it's one thing to pray for God to do something, and it's another thing to say, and God, use me. <laughs> I don't know, but I tried the other kind, you know, when I used to pray for my finals. God, I just pray you'll bless my finals. Now, I don't want to study, but, <laughs> but please, son, stand still. It, you know, it didn't work. Because I believe most miracles God doesn't do for you, he does through you. It's like, God, I, I want to get a victory here, and I'm asking, but I'm also saying, God, when I study, let my thoughts be led by you. God, when I work on my marriage, I would rather just pray, God, please change my wife and so our marriage will be a blessing. And, uh, it doesn't work. But if I'll pray another way, God, I pray in the name of Jesus, that you'll transform me and make me the husband that would love her like Christ loves the church. I pray in my spirit that there will be a new way for me to connect and that as a result, my wife will be blessed and we will, all of a sudden, God starts to move because I'm saying, God, don't just do it for me, do it through me. And when you pray that way, God, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm praying like it all depends on you, and I'm working like it all depends on me, but between those two, we're going to make a difference in this world. And you give your heart to it in faith. I was very blessed by She's taken a giant step of faith to, to, to seek to adopt. Parents are unable to take care of it, and the child is in foster care, and it seems so impossible. But she was just telling me how she got ministered to because... Someone was talking about the prodigal son. And when he came home, remember there was a fattened calf. And they had a party. And this person had said to her that, that hey, the calf was fattened while the prodigal was still lost. <laughs> How many know you got to prepare for the miracle when it doesn't look like one's coming? Start fattening that cow and your prodigal will come home, you know. And she was like... Okay, I'm going to fix up the bedroom. I know it's impossible, but I'm going to begin to put action to my faith. I'm going to begin to believe, and I'm going to begin to behave differently because of what I believe. And God answers prayers like that. Hallelujah. And finally, this story teaches us that the miracles happen not just by one person praying, but a team of people fighting together. It's so clear that Joshua's miracle started with the faith of one, but it was sustained and realized by the faith of many. It started with his faith, but then his, his, his soldiers came around him and said, that'll be my faith too. That'll be what I believe God for too. And collectively, God did something amazing. The Bible teaches us over and over that when prayers are corroborated. When, 
when two or more of you shall gather, I'm going to be there in a way that's different. If two of you will agree, have you ever wondered, for example, in marriage, why is it so hard for husbands and wives to agree? Why is it so hard for them to pray together? Because the enemy knows if they ever learn how to be in agreement and they ever dialogue and they say, honey, what do you think? Here's what I think. Oh, I think the Holy Spirit say, and they come and they do the hard work to hear God together. Woo, nothing can stop their prayers then. If two or three of you bind, which means make a contract with God about something on earth, he will make a contract in heaven. If, if the gathering of you becomes a place that's more than just social, but it becomes community. It becomes you getting to know and care about each other. It begins to become, I'm going to weep with you when you weep, and I'm going to rejoice with you when you rejoice. Your burdens are going to be my burdens, and my burdens are going to be yours. We are going to be walking circles around the prayers together. Then God says, watch out, because nothing will be impossible for you. We live in a world today, and I, I'm really, really burdened by this, where Christians are becoming more isolated than they ever have been. I mean, we've got it all, right? We got it all on our little screens, you know, that we could just look at, and, and we call it, you know, social media, and we're walking around, and we're looking at this, and we're, we're doing social media. How many know there's nothing social about talking to a telephone or texting on a telephone? Hebrews says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together, as is the manner of some, but come together more and more as you see the day approaching. Realize that there is no substitute for spiritual family, for sharing your hearts with somebody else, and them circling you and taking your request before the Lord. I love this quote that says, We follow Jesus for ourselves. But we cannot effectively follow Jesus by ourselves. You know why? You might get all fired up, but if you're by yourself, you're going to get attacked. And you're going to get discouraged. And by about Thursday or Friday, you're going to be like, oh, I, just, I used to have faith. I'm just trying to survive today. And you're going to feel overwhelmed. And I don't know if I can do this anymore. I don't even want to go to church now because I'm so bummed out. And so I'll become more isolated next week. And the enemy just starts drawing circles around you. I got this one. He loves to come after Lone Ranger Christians, you know. And when we do the opposite, and we say, God, I, I know to follow you at my highest level, it will be in community. It won't be alone. And I will do whatever it takes to get three, five, six, eight people in my life to change the world together. Amen? <laughs> so just let me just conclude with these questions. What is an area of life that you need a standstill sun kind of prayer today? <laughs> Start to, to dial it up. Start to, we're believing this season of miracles. And we want to hear your prayer requests. We want you to send them to us. I mean, we're on a roll praying every day at 6.30. Man, we got time. <laughs> so give me your prayer request, man. We're going after them, I'm telling you. Number two, what is an area of your life that God is stirring up a holy discontent to rebel against the status quo? To say that enough is enough. God, do something here. What would it take for you to adjust your life so that you... Begin to pray at a deep level. I say, be a score changer, not just a game player. I, I just heard a football player say, I'm not satisfied to be a good football player. I want to be a score changer. <laughs> when I go out, the game's going to be different. How many know that's what God needs Christians to be? The score's going to change where I work for Jesus, I tell you. Because I'm going for it in his name. Will you choose to spend time to leave a legacy of sun stand still kinds of prayers for your family, for people around you? 
and for those yet to be born. Would you stand with me? I'm going to just close in worship song and prayer. Lord, at the beginning of this campaign, we know this is historic, that we are making history. That history is always made when people pray bold prayers. Something changes in the atmosphere. Something begins to shift into families and homes. Because suddenly, we're not fighting, we're letting God fight for us. Suddenly there is the supernatural partner of the Holy Spirit stepping in, moving in. Today, so many of you here just need God's presence to step in somewhere. Would you just ask Him? Do not take light the opportunity to ask God to do something that only He can do. Just be real and honest with Him right where you're standing. Say, God, we need a sun stand still kind of miracle in our family. God, we can't just keep going this way. We need a sun stand miracle in dealing with this addiction, dealing with this issue that's just killing us. God, we're crying out to you. We need you, God. We have promises that right here you made them for us. And you said you would come. You said you would heal. And we're calling on you to do it. And there's someone here today. This is the day you just need to make peace with the Lord. Get back on track. The Bible says a righteous person falls seven times, but then they get up again. I don't know what's happened in your life, but it's time to get back on track. To say, Lord, I, I just sorry. Would you make this mess and mistakes into a miracle? Would you do something in spite of all of that's happened? I want to give my life to you. I wonder how many here would just say, God, I'm ready to let you take over. I'm ready, Lord. Would you just pray this prayer? Lord Jesus, take over. I'm sorry. I believe that you died for me, that you rose again and that you love me. I give you control. Jesus, be the Lord of my life. Turn it around. Step into our home. Make it your abode. We give it to you, Lord. In the name of Jesus. And again, as we close, prayer teams will be here. Maybe someone, the Holy Spirit's convicting you. We can just pray with you after the service. If you need a Bible, we'll give that to you. We'll help you get back going very strong with Jesus. There's still prayers of healing we'd like to pray. Whatever, we would like to invite you to stay for that. And so, Lord, today we begin this time of prayer for the next several days. And we ask for the spirit of grace and supplication to fill our hearts. That we would just find ourselves praying through the day at deeper levels. We pray for our small groups and life groups this week as they launch that the great work of God will happen in every single one of them that lives will change and you will get the glory bless each one as they go in Jesus name everybody say amen